and welcome to Always Take Notes. A message from our sponsor, Vitsu, Melvin's story. We love, love, love our Vitsu shelving. Build quality and ease of assembly is amazing, but it was your service that made the whole process such a joy. So said Melvin from Sydney in this heartfelt message to his Vitsu planner Sophie in London. Love is a word heard a lot at Vitsu. Other verbs just don't seem to cut it. As with any customer, Sophie considered every detail, so Melvin's bookshelves were perfect for his needs. Passionate about good service, she communicates with all her customers directly, wherever they are in the world. Whether in person or on the other side of the globe, Vitsu's planners hold your hand throughout the process, time and again proving that long-distance relationships really do work. Every interaction is handled with love from Vitsu. Vitsu's 606 Universal Shelving System is a modular adaptable kit of parts. It can provide the perfect home for your books and even the desk from which to write one. Visit vitsu.com, that's V-I-T-S-O-E dot com, or request a free brochure via email at vitsu.com by quoting ATN 606. Vitsu, makers of long living furniture by Dieter Rams. Hello and welcome to Always Take Notes. In this episode, we spoke to Marianne Tatepo, commissioning editor at Ebury Press. We spoke to Marianne about completing an MA in publishing, her experience working at different publishing houses and setting up the Black Agents and Editors Group. It's a great episode. We hope you enjoy it. Marianne, welcome to Always Take Notes. It's excellent to have you on the show. Could we start by you telling us a bit about where your interest in literature originally came from? Where does that, when, when do you mention that as a sort of point of departure for you? That's a really good thing to be asking. I'm the usual type of reader, writer, editor person. Um, it happened very early on. Um, except actually my personal story comes into it as well and my personal story is that i have eight siblings and i'm the youngest i'm the ninth and i was always looking for respite i was always looking for kind of an oasis of calm in the commotion um we were all living at home at various points of our lives my eldest brother is 25 years older than i am so big age gaps uh and so for me it was that escape uh, and that creativity and that connection to word and communication and language and the language in question at the time was actually French for me so probably I was six or seven reading books about animals, uh, narratives around animals, fables, things like that. Uh, I love puns, I loved kind of naughty behavior, um, hijinks. So I've tried to remember the name of the first book I remember reading and I've not managed. I reckon it was some kind of a Roald Dahl book about a fox. I remember my sister giving it to me for a Christmas kind of um, gift. And I remember getting it, opening it and scurrying away from everybody. So yeah, in a way it's probably the story that many people connect with. Um, And yeah, it happened very early. And I guess, I don't know if you'd, if you'd call that literature, it snowballed from there uh, when I, I got a little bit older. And then I started reading a lot of young adult novels. Uh, that's where all my allowance went into um, buying these. A lot of the time they were actually translated from English into French. And then I, I, I started learning English when I was six, seven years old anyways. So eventually I just started buying those books in English as well. I was brought up um, bilingual pretty much. So that's, you know, that was just the way that we operated. Uh, So I'd buy a lot of, it was, some of them were dystopian young adult novels. Some of them were kind of love stories. Um, And then I eventually at about the age of 13 and 14, I got into a bit more of the classics, studying them in school as well. So I ended up falling in love with A Clockwork Orange I fell in love with the use of language, which I felt was really original. Um, I fell in love with the kind of quirky characters 
robbers who were very problematic and very violent. And I liked looking at the ills uh, of society with that lens. So from that age onwards, essentially, I was hooked. And I'm a quite decisive person. So I decided there and then I want to study this. I want to do this in some capacity. I want my life to involve this. Well, and then it's an obvious step to studying comparative literature and film at university. What was that experience like? It was, yeah, it was a seamless kind of step. I went from, aha, uh-huh, I'm enjoying reading all of these books to, okay, I'm going to move to London. I'm going to study this course. And I really wanted to, you know, look at storytelling beyond just format, hence the kind of film element of my degree. I thought these stories translate across mediums. So um, that was really important to me. Uh, I moved to London in 2010. Uh, The Eurostar was really kind to me. I took a one way ticket, haven't looked back. And I, you know, I, again, the fact that it was comparative literature for me is important in this conversation. I didn't want to be doing English literature. I felt First of all, as a polyglot, as a polyglot who was brought up initially bilingual, I ended up learning Dutch. I ended up studying Spanish. Later on, I did some German. I still not been to Germany, so I've not made good use of that. Uh, But I felt like it was limiting to only look at narratives that came out of the English speaking world. So that was a really conscious decision when I was younger and I I was at King's and essentially they enabled us to um, study modules across different departments, the French department, um, the kind of, you could do uh, medieval studies, you could do contemporary 21st century novels, American studies, you could do all these different disciplines. And that really mattered to me. So I, I enjoyed that flexibility and the wider look at what made interesting stories, narratives, uh, characters, perspectives. Um, and for me, it's always been about being multidisciplinary in everything I do. So that is something I really appreciated. What I was a bit more critical of um, was the fact that actually universities are very academic. And that sounds silly because, well, it's an, it's a, it's an academic institution. What else would it be? But there was very little emphasis on what you do with that knowledge and that how you apply that knowledge to what I what I'm going to call the real world as in the world of employment you know what do you do next I very kind of keenly decided to be careers rep whilst I was at King's at a time when most of my um, most of my peers were not really thinking in career terms to be honest so and financially a lot of them didn't need to and I did so that, that was my one concern about the studies that I, I picked. It wasn't a clear path. And it's also kind of a structural thing about the UK where you can do a degree and then you can have a completely different career. In a way, the kind of rigid nature of France and Belgium and some other countries is limiting. But in another way, it means that when you're 20, 21 years old, you can be a little bit adrift because you could go in any direction. Um, but I, you know, I I found it interesting, even amidst kind of, I mentioned multidisciplinary and global um, aspirations of the degree I undertook. I took issue occasionally with, you know, the, the diversity of the titles I was studying, but not, it's not just the titles themselves, because actually I think it was so much better than it would have been for me in school the the teaching body was maybe not the most diverse ultimately and i think that might have changed now so i was conscious of all these things i didn't necessarily articulate them uh there and then but i just felt i just felt like everything was geared towards the status quo i i was very conscious of that at that young age um and a thing that happened was well as i was finishing up my degree is there was a an internship with Pearson and I thought about applying it was on the strand as well thought about applying it was for underrepresented people and someone in my personal life at the time um, 
who wasn't from one of those groups said, why should you have it any easier than I, than I do or that we do? And I think that instilled a sense of shame in me at the time. I remember that. And I just didn't go for it, which, which in retrospect is obviously a shame. And there's no way that I would replicate that behavior and having now grown up a little bit. So I ended up, even though I had that very obvious interest quite early on, I ended up thinking, ah, uh, that's true. Why am I thinking of, you know, going for this opportunity? Um, I should just do what everyone else is doing, which is silly for reasons I'm sure we'll unpack later on in this conversation. But um, that was a big deterrent. I was lucky actually at King's. I was I did a creative writing module and that was with Andrew Hagen, but I didn't really understand the ecosystem back then. So, yeah, it was really formative and I got a lot out of it clearly. Um, but, you know, there were these flaws that at the time weren't really being looked at. What would be your response to that person who questioned that internship if you were speaking to them now? I would definitely, for various other reasons, distance myself in a quite def definitive way. Um, you know, I there are so many arguments around structural inequality arguments that the person in question and many others in his position it's a man i don't know how relevant that is it might be to some of our listeners uh don't want to engage with because so i think once you engage with the arguments once you engage with the reality of other people it's very hard to deny my understanding of the issue and most people i've spoken to who are in my position as uh black people or ethnic minority people or otherwise marginalized people would tell you, and that's what I'm going to say, that we live in an imperfect society. We do what we can, where we can, but ultimately um, even well-meaning people who sometimes hide behind the idea that they're well-meaning or the reality of it or the aspiration of it um, have biases. And some of those biases aren't conscious. Some of them are cultivated through lack of effort to be inclusive, open and empathetic uh, towards those around them who haven't grown up in the same institutions and ecosystems and don't have the same access to cultural capital. And it sounds like a mouthful when I'm saying it like that, but what I'm saying is when I was growing up, my sister would get me books for Christmas. I would go and buy myself books. And, you know, I had enough pocket money that I could buy myself one or two books a month. Uh, I had access to libraries and I knew to use them and I did do that. However, I did not grow up in a household barricaded with hardbacks. Uh, we, you know, we had, I, I had access to some of my siblings' school books from previous years and I would read those and discover some of the classics I mentioned through that. Um, but I did not grow up in a household where I was actually actively encouraged to um, consider and ponder, you know, the greatness of the canon. That was not, that was not the world I grew up in. Whereas, you know, a lot of people in my industry now publishing um, and adjacent industries, a lot of the time they were part of households where previous generations had been part of higher echelons of society. And, you know, some of them maybe even had parents within that ecosystem directly. Um, I was a kind of, or I am a kind of, you know, first generation belgo cameroonian um person individual whose parents grew up in what would you know kind of clumsily be described as favelas in cameroon in different parts of cameroon with no electricity and running water uh, i'm not ashamed of it but it's it's worlds apart from what i know now so i'm sure you know i'm sure the person in question that conversation came up and they knew better um, but yeah, I would say that I, I did not grow up, I did not grow up with a kind of defined path that meant I could just slide into those environments, like for instance, publishing. Hence, you know, those kind of programs, which are highly imperfect for those of us who didn't start on a route where we would end up there, or we could easily ask someone to help us get there it makes a difference. 
we'll return to the publishing industry and, and the subject of exclusion um, later on. Um, but could we talk a little bit about the work that you did when you decided to move away from publishing at that period? You did um, a traineeship at a writing development agency and you did an internship at The Guardian. Is that right? I did. So whilst I was a student, I needed to pay rent, which not everyone I met on my journey needed to do that. So whilst I was a student, I worked initially in catering and I am or I was at the time clumsy, probably because I had iron deficiency, to be honest with you. I think I was anemic. I was very clumsy, so that didn't last very long. A lot of plates were broken. A lot of hearts were broken. I'm joking about hearts, but plates definitely. Uh, so I did that for a bit, and then I, I had a job, weirdly, very kind of lateral thinking here, but I, I worked for a financial technology company. Before tech was really a thing, I was doing that job, and it was essentially a company that research investment banking styles so i did a lot of that work as a student I was really young so i would dress up in my pencil skirt pencil dress uh, there was a strict dress code you were not allowed to wear anything that was i think cotton you could wear jersey and other materials it was quite specific black shoes white shirts so uh i would come it's in very specific so specific <laughs> level of at the level of fabric. Oof. I had to think about fabrics very closely for the first time in my life. And I couldn't even afford clothes. So I go to Primark and buy terrible pumps and trousers. And once they tore and essentially they sent me home because there was a hole in my trousers. But anyways, uh, so I worked for that company for a while. And that was my first office job. I was, I think, 19. Um, and I did it again because I needed to pay rent. And it was close to campus so I'd go in with my pencil skirts and do my James Joyce seminars and then run off to the city uh it was comical and, and strange and then when I finished university I studied I, I worked for Discovery Channel for a little bit on a on a kind of fixed term assignment off the back of having had one office job really um and then I did realize at that stage wait a minute you do want to be doing that literature stuff you do want to be working with books um so I, for a little while right after university i ended up working for a company that did kind of awards and events and things like that for the creative industries uh it was a job they paid me they kept me they promoted me a handful of times so i stuck around but then yeah uh maybe one or two years into that situation i realized you really want to you really want to do something to do with writing so i applied to master's degrees i did not have savings i just thought i will apply and my mentality in life is always go for it and then figure out the solution so even though i knew i was broke i just thought let's let's see what they have to say this funding this things uh and i applied for actually some journalism courses and some publishing courses but what I found really appealing about um, publishing was the kind of lasting, I guess, I, I felt like books were permanent in a way where uh, with journalism, as someone who was foreign and adrift and broke, I knew that I couldn't afford even one month where my invoices were late. Um, so, yeah, I, I guess from then on, um, I ended up, I applied to the master's degree and I ended up negotiating with my company that I would work three days a week and then I would go to classes the other day. So I did a master's at UCL in the end. Uh, I secured some funding. I, I did actually get a family member to give me some money because I didn't have any. Uh, so they agreed to doing that, to loaning me money. And then actually most of the fees, more than 50% of the fees came genuinely because two weeks before the course was due to start and I was unrolling, I found this, I found a couple of charities and I qualified. It was, one of them was uh, the book trade uh, charity and they were funding a few things. One of them was a charity for Belgian people, which I am. Um, so out of the blue, I emailed those people. I said, this is my situation. And they gave me like five grand like I, I just wouldn't have been able to do it so 
that's how that came about genuinely and then so I kept on working my job so I could pay rent and then I would go to classes do um you know assignments in the evenings and then eventually I needed to do placements but I had a job so my solution to that was I'm going to take a sabbatical in the summer so that's how I was able to um with the guardian I actually emailed the guardian as soon as I got my masters and I said I want to do stuff with you so I, I secured that through this route I I was supposed to wait for my tutors to get in touch with institutions but I I, I had a clear sense of where I wanted to be so I kind of maybe bypassed that situation a little bit um, and, and they were very welcoming so I got to sit on the on the books desk at the Guardian through that which I found really enriching because it was both sides of the coin of my my top interests um and then with i actually also did a placement with granta during this period and later on at the end of this time uh you know we had to do a dissertation for the masters and all of that um and i'd also left my full-time job uh actually i don't remember the timeline of that but i did at some point leave my job because i i i was part-time for six months and i came back full-time and then I was writing my thesis. So at one stage, um, I so that spread the word, we're doing this amazing program called Flight 1000, which they've now, I think, discontinued. But it was a hybrid editing and writing uh, traineeship. So it was about teaching you the ropes, showing you how the publishing world works. This was in 2015, end of 2015. Um, so I applied to that. They're one of the best literary organizations in existence, as far as I'm concerned. It's a really small team, really dedicated people, uh, super grassroots and about community. And so I, I applied to that. It was me and two other people for that one intake. And it was a year long program. And essentially, as part of that program, there were also placements with One World, with the Literary Consultancy. We did a little bit of work with Jack Aranda as well. So very grassroots um, and a great kind of initial foray into into how the industry works. And what was your route to HarperCollins? How did you um, get your job there? And I suppose, what's your view in general on the way that uh, recruitment works in, in British publishing? So actually something that I failed to mention is on my master's, what I found personally interesting was I observed a, a little bit of a pattern with demographics. There were 60 of us on the course and it, it might be anecdotal. It might not. I'll, I'd be interested to hear what other people think, but I was finding that a lot of uh, other people on the cohort, many of whom I'm still dear friends with, some of whom I've lived with, were being invited into jobs before the course was even done. And actually that that wasn't my experience at all. It took a long time from finishing lectures to finishing a thesis to finishing everything else. Uh, I wasn't really getting, I was getting a lot of interviews based on my CV and all of that. But then there was often a conversation around being a cultural fit or something like that, which feels a bit like subtext for something else to me occasionally. Um, so yeah that that what that wasn't really working out and actually i got the harper college job 18 months after i finished my degree um and that was interesting at the time because as i mentioned i'd started working in offices quite early so i had had kind of experience in offices um and so with harper collins at one point there were a few opportunities that aligned with my skill set i started applying to a couple of jobs with them and then they kept on kind of being in touch about other roles they had and eventually uh as i said the interviews were happening and you know i met some really wonderful people through that process i got quite familiar with the inner workings of the company i was really set on working within the fourth estate william collins division i really liked what they were doing um but it, it just hadn't worked out for a few roles and then i saw that they had a bame internship 
and I was already kind of in the running for a few other roles, but I just thought it, it won't harm to apply. And actually, it's at that stage that I went in and I met a few more people. I wasn't one of the two kind of grads that they picked for their BAME scheme, which I think that was the inaugural year of it, actually. I wasn't one of those two. Um, but off the back of that, they did have a couple other jobs. They shared those. So I applied. I was probably the fifth job I applied to in six months with them. Many, many interviews. And then actually, weirdly enough, in the end, that was the right job. Out of all of the jobs I applied for, it was the best job for me. Uh, and it was essentially an, an editorial assistant role for Fourth Estate and William Collins. So what I think about recruitment, I think, as I said, from talking to other people on the course, noticing um, what the other few people of color I studied with at UCL, noticing their track record with securing jobs and then the retention, the retention of that, uh, you know, of the people who were marginalized uh, in the industry has been quite poor. So I find that really interesting and telling. I mean, people leave, but I find the ratios that I noticed to be indicative of all the conversations that people have been having in publishing. And on a personal level, um, I think I can be a little bit unflappable occasionally, or at least on the surface, because, you know, I'll find a way. If, if it doesn't work out the way I intended, I'll find another way to make things work. So. I'm I'm happy I have that personal disposition, but ultimately we're people and we're sensitive and it hurts and it can be harmful to get certain messages in those environments. I mean, one of the worst experiences I've had, and I talked about this in um, the issue of the bookseller that we did uh, called The Black Issue. I went to this one interview and <clears throat> in terms of technical skills, I knew that I could do the bulk of everything being asked. Uh, it was an organization I was curious about. So I had an interview, it all went quite positively. We had a good exchange. Um, you know, we went through the tasks. They all sounded really feasible and in line with actually the, the, the jo job I was in already. And then at the end, a woman looked up at me and went, so Marianne, if you don't get this job, can you eat? <laughs> And obviously, in my mind, I, w I went, what? But obviously, I just found a way to solve a situation, A, by not reacting strongly to it, even though I knew it was unacceptable, but B, by just showing kind of if that was meant to be a provocation, that I wouldn't rise to it. And my response was something along the lines of, well, at the minute, I'm doing these other freelance projects. So, you know, there's a lot of great stuff in the pipeline. But, you know, this is a great opportunity. What else am, What else was I meant to say? Someone asking me as if I'm a child from Darfur, from UNICEF, without my benevolence, can you survive? So that, you know, I, I never really heard these things from um, my white peers in publishing, to be honest with you. I'm not saying I've heard about bad interviews, but there was something loaded about being asked something like that. And I've heard other stories confidentially through people, friends or younger people coming up in the industry that I find a little bit alarming. Um, and I think we have to do better in the industry in terms of tokenism with recruitment and thinking about how showing how proactive we're being about inclusion, uh, you know, allegedly and, and diversity, how that feels for the people on the receiving end that we're showcase we're showcasing for instance if you're showcasing a lot of people of color who are in interview stages are you doing the same thing with your white candidates can you do that are you just you know is it is it meant to be is it meant to be about developing people's talent and opening up the door and giving opportunity or is it meant to be about showcasing that you're your good people, you know, who is it serving? So I have a lot of questions around that. Yeah. Well, I want, again, I promise we're going to come back to all of this, particularly your 15 steps to doing better. Um, but what was the move from uh, HarperCollins to Penguin General motivated by? So 
I spent a couple of years at HarperCollins and I was working, as I said, for Fisset and William Collins. Um, and that was obviously a very literary list. I really loved reading uh, many of those books in my own time. But I think what I ended up finding in the particular role I was in was a lot of the time, those weren't necessarily the books my friends ended up talking to me about, my friends who are not in publishing. And I felt really excited about the prospect of working on titles that, um, you know, the average person I know would pick up at, say, Oliver Bonus. And I thought that would be really interesting to be able to shape those books. Um, and obviously, I'd admired Penguin for so many years. Um, so to me, it felt like it was a kind of unmissable opportunity. Uh, when I moved over to Penguin, I was at Penguin General. <clears throat> I was working with Benicia Butterfield, who at the time was um, publishing director and then later on was publisher. And, you know, she's a total, um, she's a total force of nature. She's a powerhouse. She works across kind of commercial nonfiction, uh, commercial fiction, literary fiction, literary nonfiction. And I, I really, relished the opportunity of working alongside her and learning a lot under her. So, you know, I went, I went with the flow. It was, you know, also obviously a promotion and that's always a factor. Uh, career progression, you know, is important to many people for various reasons. And that was just an all round great opportunity to have. <clears throat> so I went for it. Um, and yeah, that, you know, that was my primary motivation being able to work on books that reach a lot of different audiences. That was a big kind of driving force behind that move. And we were definitely doing many, uh, m the titles I worked on were definitely a lot more commercial, um, which I think for a lot of people is a dirty word, but for me, it's kind of a win-win. It's thinking I can pitch this book to my parents and they'll get it. Not that I do that. Um, you know, my friends will have heard about this and this is so, ex you know, this is accessible and interesting. And a lot of the books we did had that perfect sort of sweet spot between it will sell well, it's practical, it's relevant to people's lives. Um, so, yeah, that was that was the, you know, that was a primary reason for me. A message from our sponsor, Writing Magazine. If you've always wanted to write, but never known how to start, or if you've already got a book under your belt, Writing Magazine is just what you need to practice, develop and publish your written work. Filled with author profiles, tips from agents and advice from publishers, Writing Magazine is a great way to get you started, or back in the saddle, with writing of any genre. Discover how to beat writer's block, develop a character, write for children or choose a genre, it's all there in every issue. Writing Magazine have provided an exclusive discount for listeners of Always Take Notes. Download their digital magazine and try their introductory subscription offer at three issues for just £4.99, worth £18. You can claim this offer online and the link is in the show notes. As a subscriber, you also benefit from discounted entry into their monthly writing competitions, which is a great way to practice your skills and potentially win cash prizes and publication in their magazine. Offer ends 31st of January, 2022. Could you tell us about some of these books in particular um, that, that you've worked on? So you mentioned um, Hill House Living by Paula Sutton, Misfits by Michaela, uh, Michaela Cole, and then Burn After Writing by, by Sharon Jones. Could you explain a bit about you know, where those books came from and what your involvement with them was. Yeah, so at Penguin Random House, um, you know, I've been at Penguin Random House for coming on to three years now, but um, I moved from one bit of the business, Penguin General, over to Ebury um, in April 2020. <laughs> uh, 1st of April, April's Fool's Day pandemic. It was fantastic. And so those three books that you've mentioned are books that I've commissioned because obviously before I was working closely with Benicia and a lot of those titles were ones she had primarily commissioned. Um, and so Hill House Vintage is, it's a kind of, it's, it's an illustrated title that we shot on location 
over lockdown. It was probably the best thing that happened to me in lockdown. Um, and it's by Paula Sutton, who is known online as at Hill House Vintage. She's got about half a million followers. She's based in the English countryside and her background is she used to actually be um, head of press for Elite Models and bookings editor for Elle UK. Uh, and then 10 years ago, after a 20 year career in fashion, um, she decided she needed to slow down. Uh, she and her husband decided to move to the country to buy a beautiful house, <clears throat> put all their life savings into that, uproot themselves um, and just slow down a little bit. So it's, it's bringing together her experiences with renovating, um, her outlook on kind of creating joy as a kind of almost practice, a proactive thing that you decide to embrace in your life rather than something that just exists every day. Uh, and it's a mixture of her styling advice, some recipes, some sort of practical DIY projects. Uh, and as I said, we spent kind of almost a year bringing it to life with hundreds of photographs, creating recipes, um, putting together advice for, for instance, buying antiques and vintage items. Um, and she's the one author that anytime I mention her to people, first of all, they're probably following her already on Instagram, but she just brings a smile to people's faces and she's she is just a force for good. So that book, actually initially, I was following her uh, last spring when everything was a little bit morose and I was getting my daily fix of just wholesomeness and awesomeness from her. And I got in touch via DM um, on Instagram and I was very adamant about talking to her. I got in touch on LinkedIn. I tried a few different avenues uh, and eventually I got a response. But actually, because she was growing, you know, she had a quite large platform previously, uh, but, you know, she had a viral post and she went from a kind of quarter million followers to maybe 400,000 and then it kept growing. So she ended up enlisting a management team. She'd been doing blogging, styling, uh, vintage related uh, kind of content writing for the best part of 10 years already, but she had many new opportunities through that uh, exposure of her existing work. So in the end, although I was very clearly keen uh, from day dot, um, it ended up going to auction and, you know, we ended up bidding for it and working alongside uh, Penguin in the US as well uh, for a simultaneous publication. And yeah, you know, we, we shaped the whole thing. Um, we had a brilliant proposal. We shaped the whole thing together to just bring it to life. Um, and, you know, it's just been a really amazing um, process. And there's something about knowing that you're bringing out these books that can genuinely change people's lives in real practical terms. And that book, I hope, is going to achieve that. It's out in October. Um, and yeah, it's really close to my heart. Was it a similar process with Michaela Cole's book, Misfits? As in, did you did you approach her or did she kind of come with a proposal and you and you bid for it? Yeah, I, I try and be proactive in life. Um, so that was kind of my thinking. Again, you know, Michaela's someone I followed for some time. Uh, but in fact, I'd followed her for years. And I think... At Ebri, where I work, we are all encouraged to be as proactive as possible, um, to be constantly thinking of new ideas and new angles and audiences we're not already reaching. That's absolutely core to the way in which we work, which is not true of every place. I think, yeah, we were just injected with this energy and drive at Ebri. So I had been following her. I'd hope that she'd write something but the proposal wasn't coming to me. So I sat there and then I thought, if it's not coming to me, I should go to it. So I went kind of, yeah, straight to the source. And it was just brilliant conversation about what that initial book might be. And, you know, I, I'd seen that lecture and I'd, I'd been amazed watching it. And yeah, we ended up putting our heads together, brainstorming and developing uh, an idea and it kind of, progress expanded into this like amazing little book uh called misfits personal manifesto and it's based around the lecture where she talks about actually a lot of the themes that are addressed in her hit um you know bbc series i may destroy you 
are kind of intertwined with that lecture. She talks about, uh, and I don't know if I should mention this myself, but trigger warning, um, sec the sexual violence she endured, um, which informed the plot line of, of the show, I May Destroy You. She talks about racism in the entertainment industry and uh, I guess misogyny and misogynoir, which is the intersection of the two. Um, and it felt really rich. It's her talking to an audience of 4,000 people for one hour uninterrupted. And I thought there's something there. It might be, you know, a short thing, but there's something bigger. And so the lecture uh, was a starting point, but now it's kind of taking life of its own. Um, and she's managed to roll into that kind of allegory and kind of poetic writing and reflections and meditations and it, it has a potentially self-help almost element there um so yeah that was uh that was the process so maybe a bit of an unusual one it wasn't an auction it wasn't a thing that someone sent me but it was something that we built together um and and yeah we're publishing that in september um 2021 yeah could you tell us about setting up the black agents and editors group um and then following on from that about this this 15 uh step manifesto that you've you've put together of course so back in spring 2020 again you know we all know what that was like uh i actually spent a bit of time on furlough and initially it was fun playing guitar most of the day for me not for my neighbors uh it was nice getting to a bit of reading it was entertaining um until it wasn't and i was noticing a vacuum i was noticing a kind of community shaped hole in my life you know i'm today i'm at an office i haven't been to an office for 18 months really um all of these random chance encounters and interactions with people were just completely gone and at the same time everyone was going through that but there was a subset of society that i felt were going through something deeper and more insidious uh and that was black people as first of all you know um, BAME, as we call them, statistically, people were over-indexing on COVID um, deaths. And then there was a lot of violence happening in the US and, you know, George Floyd's murder was a turning point. And it was just very difficult time. A lot of the conversations that people are having now around inclusion, language, diversity, uh, sensitivity, freedom of speech and all of that in, in publishing these days, um, were happening on a massive scale with a lot of visibility and exposure. It felt very, yeah, it felt very like everyone was under the microscope. And I wanted to talk to, normally I would have talked to a few colleagues or friends at the office about it. Uh, and I, I just felt like, oh, so I just need to hold these feelings all day and I can't talk to anyone. But also generally speaking, I I love connecting with new people in my industry and outside of it. so. Uh, I I thought it would be really nice to have a space where I could talk to other people experiencing the same stuff. Um, and that's how initially it was a Twitter DM and then I created a WhatsApp group and then I created a website. I was able to do that because I was on furlough, but um, it, it's been great to kind of see it grow. And there's, I think, just shy of 60 people now, which I find uh, just amazing because a lot of the time people want to tell you there's not many people of color in the industry. I found 60 black people who are agents and editors, um, and I'm sure there's more. Not everyone has joined, not everyone needs to join, but yeah, it's just, that was the thinking around um, creating that space. Um, were you asking me also about kind of latest developments? I get that. Uh, about your 15 step. Yeah, so with the steps, it was kind of crowdsourced. Um, again, this it's an open space that I facilitate for anyone in the industry. Um, and, and the 15 steps came because I was part of um, the Frank Frankfurt Book Fair uh, panel event last year, or in fact, it was um, Future Book with the bookseller. And I was invited to talk about kind of how can we do better in publishing? And I realized there were kind of a few recurring themes of conversations with members um, and I wanted to represent their views and I wanted to kind of make light of how it was 
being experienced by black people. And I say black people, but I think it does apply to other groups, but I'm, I'm only talking from a position I understand. So I can't assume that it's the same if you're Muslim. I can't assume it's the same if you're Southeast Asian, but I know that many and most black people I've spoken to in the industry have said that this is what they experience. So it was based around anonymous feedback. Some of it was public feedback. Um, and, you know, I, I'm going to pull out the list maybe because I can't actually tell you uh, all of the points, but it's the idea is we're trying to offer um, quite immediate steps for people to consider. I mean, it's not a step by step in, in the sense that I'm not actually telling them, well, go and do this, go on this website or hire exactly like this. But the idea is these are things that we believe we everyone who's part of Bay believes will change things. And, you know, I don't know if I have time to kind of go through everything, but it's actually there's a couple of words for each line. So, for example, demystify publishing, abolish nepotism, accept taste is relative, value lived experience, comp books beyond race, outsource sensitivity reads, create clear progression paths, dismantle the BAME acronym, make DNI, diversity and inclusion intersectional, disavow white supremacy, transcend unconscious bias, invest in black audiences, compensate black authors equally, respect black experts equally, 15, stop pigeonholing black talent. Uh, yeah, we tried to keep it very top line. It's probably 50 words long. Uh, and, you know, we've expanded on that piece since for the magazine we did for the bookseller. Um, but yeah, the thinking behind that was, I think a lot of people were saying, but what, what can I do? And, and they were leaning and leaning into their guilt rather than, um, I guess, innovating as to their behavior. Uh, and so, yeah, it's just something we wanted to feed back, something that felt tangible, at least intellectually. And then it's open to interpretation, but there are actually, they're actually very pointed steps, for instance, comping beyond race. That's a very obvious thing, outsourcing sensitivity reads. So that was, that was the initial uh, impulse, thinking, impetus. Um, and, you know, I hope, I hope it's something that people revisit considering a lot of these debates are still happening these days. We can absolutely put a link to that in the show notes. Um, you said earlier that there's a problem with retaining black and minority ethnic people that work in publishing. Why is that and, and how could that be improved? Is it partly along the lines of the 15 steps that you've just mentioned? I, based on conversations I've had with people who are senior to myself, based on listening to, you know, what my predecessors have said, I think it probably is about those 15 steps. I actually think it sounds grand, but I think the answers, the answer lies in those steps. I think we haven't done these things. I think probably if we did all these things, we'd be miles ahead from where we are now. Um, and I think it's kind of, you know, also sometimes people aren't actively excluding others, but it's not about ways in which you're actively excluding others. It's how are you actively including everyone, you know? So for instance, if you're in an office and there's now a two-way system in an office where you can get up with the lift, but you have to go down through the stairs, what does that mean for your employees who are disabled? Uh, you know, have you thought about that? Of course you could say, well, of course we can make an exception for them, but even the kind of signage around that is assuming that everyone has the same abilities and ease of movement. So I think my understanding of it is personally uh, opportunities to bond in an intimate setting happen behind closed doors. And one of the motivators uh, behind creating Bay Black Agents and Editors Group was that I read this piece from the US in Zola, which is a, a medium uh, publication which explained from someone who used to be in the industry many, many years ago, that one of the ways in which people stay in publishing is because of mentoring, because someone will have a sense of your career trajectory, keep you in mind for opportunities, put you forward, and then train you up. 
and anecdotally in my case uh i'd be remiss not to mention this i wrote a piece for the bookseller in 2015 i think uh about quote unquote diversity and ayla ahmed who's now publishing director at um well what was previously william heineman but they've just renamed it and i'm i'm forgetting the name uh but hutchinson heineman she got in touch with me on the back of that on twitter and said i like the piece are you trying to be a journalist are you trying to be an editor what are you you know what is the way forward for you and i said i want to work in publishing and i told her what i was applying for and she said come to the office she got me breakfast she helped me prep for the interview i did not get that job and a lot of the stories i told today and with i did not get that job and i think that's important for people to hear because you don't always get the job but she prepared me for the next job that came up that was the right fit for me and where people understood my potential personality and where i had the right skill set so the fact she took some time out of her day she spent some money to you know give me a chance made a huge difference because it's not just in terms of cv cover letter skills it was someone telling me personally i see potential in you if you come into this industry you will be welcome supported and accepted and i think that doesn't happen hence why a big part of bay is obviously the community thing i said for people already in the industry but it's also about once you get into the industry how how can you be supported as everyone should be not just people of color obviously we all need to be supported but we also sometimes need that extra boost from someone who can vouch for us and that doesn't happen for a lot of black people according to statistics that exist out there it doesn't tend to happen particularly in publishing where I mentioned my own an anecdotal story of my parents grew up, you know, in a very poor environment. They don't have contacts to give me. So I think that's probably a huge factor and I'm curious to see further interpretations of those 15 steps we came up with. And what are we're coming up against our time limit now, but what is the next thing for you? What is the direction that you want to go in in terms of the kind of books you're working on and the, the sort of jobs and roles that you're going for? I'm lucky at Ebri because I think we're afforded a lot of freedom as nonfiction editors. We're a nonfiction focused division and we have that kind of mentality. We know our audiences very well. So for me, it's all about how can I keep on publishing books for a variety of audiences? Um, and also what does a truly inclusive book look like? Is there a way in which you lay out the text, design the book that is even more inclusive than what we're doing now? So trying to come up with these solutions. Um, but I'm, I'm fortunate in that we have four sort of what we call hubs at Ivory, self, entertainment, um, lifestyle and smart. And I'm kind of able to work across these hubs and my dedicated hub is lifestyle but for me it's about constantly reinterpreting and questioning what lifestyle means because i think historically it's been geared at a particular group of individuals and i think there's more to come so within well-being you know uh what what kind of things can we do around mental health that we're not already doing um how can we take into consideration people who are autistic, for instance, people who are unable bodied. So it's all about, yeah, being creative around that. And for me, it's not a kind of, it's not a gimmick. I'm not thinking, what am I going to do for black authors? But I try and read, or black authors, black readers even, I try and read media and consume media and, and be socially engaged on social media in a way where, um, try, try to be engaged on social media in a way that means that I hear a lot of different perspectives. So it's identifying those gaps in the market. And some of the books I do might be short narrative books occasionally. Primarily, my concern is around well being, food and drink, uh, reinterpreting those categories, reinventing them. Uh, I didn't really talk to you about that book earlier, but for instance, Burn After Writing by Sharon Jones is kind of this huge TikTok viral phenomenon. Um, and it sold kind of millions of copies worldwide. So I noticed that book, I bought the rights to it. I published it in the UK um, under a brand new edition. So it's understanding what people are talking about, what people are interested in that's not being published by traditional you know, publishers 
and catering for a variety of audiences. I don't want to I don't want to describe what those audiences are because for me it's about doing a little bit for everyone. Well, that's a perfect note to end on. Thank you, Marianne, for being such a brilliant guest on Always Take Notes and all the very best with everything going forward. Thank you for having me. That was the Always Take Notes interview with Marianne Totepo. She's currently a commissioning editor at Ebury. She's on Twitter at Bronze by Gold. And in January 2022, she'll be taking up a new role as publishing director at Square Peg. Hello, it's us again. Rachel, what was your takeaway with the interview with Marianne? I've been following Marianne on Twitter for quite some time, so I'm glad we managed to get her on the show. Um, and particularly to hear uh, about how she's come to be in the position that she is now. I mean, she was listed on the bookseller's sort of most influential list in 2020, as bookseller Rising Star in 2021. So it was great to hear about how she manages her list and how she you know, works out what will make a good book and uh, goes through the process of putting it together. How about you? I thought it was a very interesting interview. There's been so much discussion in the last year or 18 months about diversity in, in publishing and particularly in publishing in the UK um, and the industry trying to, to change and to, to better reflect society. Very interesting to get um, an insider's view of that. I think clearly it's been you know not a totally smooth progression for her and she's found herself in some some fairly tricky uh, positions and, and situations as she's worked her way through, but clearly really interesting for me to see it from the inside out rather than from the outside in. Mm, and offering sort of tangible, clear steps on how change could be affected as well. Yeah, definitely a good one to have on the show. Anyway, Rachel, what have um, what have you been up to yourself? I have recently come back from a lovely two weeks away. Um, and actually in the airport lounge, I submitted my final piece of work for my uh, diploma at the NFTS. Congratulations. So that's very exciting. Yes. I actually have a vi- like Viva type thing in uh, January or February, so which I was not expecting and I'm not especially looking forward to, but I'm sure it'll be fine. Um, what have you been working on, Simon? I've also been traveling. I was in America for uh, two and a bit weeks, which was partly for work and um, then a, a bit of holiday time at the end. It was, it was really fantastic, actually. It was the first time that I had been abroad um, since the pandemic. Um, and really great to, to reacquaint myself with New York, which is a city where I have studied and worked and just generally very invigorating to, to be able to leave London and so forth. So I had a great time. Uh, it was a busy time as well. I was working on, um, a piece for 1843 and a, uh, an edit of a thing I'm doing for the LRB alongside various meetings. So it's so intense, but, but really excellent. Anyway, this has been Always Take Notes, hosted by me, Simon Aikham. And me, Rachel Lloyd. Our producer and social media editor is Artemis Irvin. Our graphic design is by James Edgar. And our score is by Jess Danheiser. If you'd like to follow us on social media, we're on Facebook and Instagram at Always Take Notes. On Twitter at Take Notes Always. Our Patreon page, if you'd like to support us in our crowdfunding efforts, is under Always Take Notes. And if you'd like to leave a review on iTunes or get in touch with us via our website, please do. Many thanks. Goodbye. Goodbye.